at this point, we're wired to think a certain way because we wired ourselves that way. We wired ourselves either consciously, because we were trying to, or unconsciously, because that's how we were raised. And you know, when kids are growing up, they're observing, they're wiring based on their observations, and that's why, unless we consciously decide not to, we become our parents. <clears throat> and so there's things that we really like about how our parents raise us and about what they do, and there's things that we don't. And if we con unless we consciously decide to do otherwise, we will turn out just like them, being programmed by what we see and observe, through mostly through images and emotions, programming the subconscious brain. So what I've done over the last few years well, actually since 2001, is when I started this brain training research. And the reason I started it is because my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. So I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I'm gonna really dive into the research and figure out how I can help her. I was already a research nerd because uh, starting back in 87, I've been devouring the research in exercise science when I was getting my degree at SPU. It got me interested in it. I started out as a psychology major, so I've always been interested in brain stuff. And then my senior year, I decided to change over to exercise science, which kept me there another year. But my dad was a professor there, so I got 95% off tuition. So I said, oh no, another year. If I was smart, I should have stayed and got my master's and then five or six PhDs. But I didn't. And so I, I ended up getting my um, exercise science degree, and, and I just really wanted to get started. I was eager to get started doing personal training, and so I was training most people out of their homes, and uh, based on the science, developed some very unique methodology. It was a lot safer, it took a lot less time, it was a lot more effective, so that business grew, because they were all telling their friends and family until it got to be too big, and I had to scale myself, so I opened the X-Gym in 98. And then um, grew, you know, XGM expansion, opened another one, expanded that one. That's where we are today. But uh, in 2000, 2001 was when my mom was diagnosed. And so I kind of added that track of research and dove into the brain research, trying to find a way to help her. And when people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it's advanced by then. And back then, it wasn't actually reversible. So they said, yeah, we can slow it down a little bit, maybe, you know, with certain drugs and stuff. But they really didn't know much about it. And so that's what I was finding out. And so I was pretty discouraged to find all that out. But, and she passed in 2005, but I had never stopped with the research. So I've always been researching exercise science stuff, the latest studies in brain science, the latest studies in nutrition science. And I still average a couple hours a day um, researching that stuff, just because I'm a total nerd on it. It's so fascinating, I can't stop. And learning tons of stuff every day. And so there's a bunch of stuff I found out with about the brain, and Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's, and MS, and a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases. And the good news, lately, just in the last year, in fact, they have discovered you can reverse Alzheimer's. So just to let you know, that's great news. And but what I discovered was mom was pretty much was doing pretty much everything wrong. And she was brilliant. She tested IQ 135 and she was great at everything she did, but she didn't eat right, she didn't like exercise, and she didn't do the right kind of brain things. And so I learned all that stuff, and now I can help other people, which is great. But a side track or path to that whole um, journey was this brain training. So what I discovered kind of on accident that really excited me, and then I'm running down that path, is you can rewire your own brain. The brain's always changing. We used to think that you were born with a certain number of brain neurons, and that's just the way you were for the rest of your life. But now we know you can add brain neurons. Even into old age, you can still add brain neurons. But the neurons that you have right now can be rewired. And that is super exciting because, and that's what brain training is all about. The object of that is the teaching the brain to rewire itself, to atrophy old nerve pathways from disuse by not using them, 
and then build new nerve pathways by using them and by wiring them. And then once that happened, your habits change. Because the boss of your brain is the subconscious. The conscious part is the front part, PFC, which we'll talk about. But the boss of it is the biggest part, the subconscious. And the brain would rather use the subconscious because it's easier than the conscious, the PFC, because it's high energy. It's a waste of energy. It thinks it's a waste of energy. And it is hard, harder. And so most of the habits are stored in the subconscious. Well, this is a way to rewire your subconscious using your conscious, the PFC. And so then you get new habits. Makes it easier. It's all about the nerve pathway. So this is a nerve impulse. And it's traveling along the axon to the termination where it jumps a little gap, thanks to some neurotransmitters, to the other nerve. And then it goes along that one and then branches off and goes somewhere else. And so that path, route represents a thought, a memory, an emotion, an action, habit, all those things. There's a lot of those going on in the brain. This is just a snapshot of an instant of how much is going on in the brain. How many of these are firing at the same time in the brain? It's truly amazing. I have to give a warning though, because this stuff, these techniques that I'm gonna teach, I'm just touching on a few. They can be used for good, like Jedi Master, or for evil, <laughs> to manipulate others. And I tell, especially I tell millennials, hey, be careful with this stuff. Don't try to get girlfriends with this, because it probably will work, and that's just manipulation. Unless you're using it on your kids, and that's totally okay. See how happy she is from being brain trained? She doesn't know, but it's good, because when kids are being raised, they need that, but train responsibly because it's very powerful stuff. So this is the PFC. This is the front part of the brain. So your eyeballs are down here. This is the front, right behind your forehead. And this is the part of the brain that has willpower, forethought, reasoning. And so when you're tired or when you have a low functioning PFC, it's harder to have willpower. It's harder to have forethought, meaning how you can look into the future and make decisions based on how it's going to affect your future self. Reasoning won't power resisting stuff, which is similar to willpower, but it is different. Good decisions and running simulations. So thinking, if I do this, what is the potential outcome? And that, along with this other stuff, is what separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. They can't do simulations. They don't have much willpower. But willpower is directly related to the size of the PFC. So that's why dogs are so trainable, especially certain kinds of dogs that have bigger PFCs, and how they can keep from eating the biscuit on their nose once they've been trained not to eat it. But then you go down in size of PFC to a cat, and it's not gonna happen. Or you go up in size to a monkey, and you know, there's even more. But the, their PFCs still, even a dolphin, is not big enough to have forethought, run simulations, and things like that. So that's how, and visualize. They can't do it, just can't do it. So it's more about instant gratification, instinct. And we'll see that even with humans that have a damaged PFC or just a low functioning PFC. But you can train it. The more you use it, the stronger it gets, the healthier it gets. And here's the rest of your brain, the subconscious. So this is like an iceberg. This is the PFC. And this part of the brain takes a lot of energy to run. It's very high energy, consumes a lot of calories. This is the rest of the brain. This part of the brain is, the, part of the job of this is to help us, you know, rationalization and the forethought and the willpower. But another job is to program the boss this part, to reprogram this part. So when you do brain training, you're using your PFC to change the wiring in this part. The subconscious has a lot more responsibility and duties and habits than the PFC. It runs on instinct, quick fix. It uses images, you program it with images and pictures and emotions. Fear is found in the subconscious. Habits, your automatic habits. Have you ever driven home and you don't remember the drive home? 
That was your subconscious getting you there. Fight or flight, reflex, memories are programmed into there. So the PFC is used for new stuff. When you learn to drive, you were using your PFC. And that's why it was hard. It took a lot of energy. But once those habits got formed, and you repeated it enough, the brain always is deciding where to put stuff. So the subconscious says, all right, we've seen this driving thing enough that let's take over so it's less energy. Pull it out of the high energy part of the brain, put it in the low energy part of the brain. It's a pattern now, it's been established. So let's put it here, and now we're not gonna take up as much energy. And the, the subconscious also wants to stick with the status quo because it likes the habits that are ingrained. Because they're easier. And that's where your dream, immediate gratification, autopilot, unconscious thoughts, patterns. So immediate gratification, especially with nutrition, is huge. We can talk about this more at the nutrition seminar, but especially when you're tired, it's harder to resist immediate gratification because you're tired, you get home, long day at work, things have happened, decision fatigue, and so your brain, your subconscious says, hey, how about some comfort food, AKA sugar and salt and starch and those kinds of things. Because the brain knows that with those foods, and with the chemicals you find in processed foods, it's going to get an immediate hit. Going to get more energy, will perk me up, because it will. It will work that way in the short term. Of course, half an hour later, you're worse off than before you ate that stuff. But the subconscious brain doesn't care, because it just, it's all it's concerned with is immediate gratification, just like the cat. And so it says, I don't care about that. The PFC is up there saying, hey, don't eat that because tomorrow you're going to regret it or in an hour you're going to regret it. But the PFC is too tired because it's the end of the day. Subconscious is more powerful. It says, ah, shut up. I want to eat this because boom, I'm going to get the, the hit that I want. You eat it. You do get the hit. The subconscious says, see, told you because it worked. And so then it gets driven even deeper, that pathway, into the subconscious. It makes it harder and harder. That's why it's so much easier in the morning to make good decisions about what to eat, a good breakfast, and so much harder at night, especially after work or even after dinner, the later it gets, the harder it gets because of this whole energy thing and because of the autopilot and the subconscious. So there's some good news and some bad news about the boss, the subconscious. The good news is the boss is like a three-year-old. So anything that works, on a three-year-old to teach or program a three-year-old is going to work on your subconscious. That's great news. Because it's pretty easy to program it. Images and pictures, stories, emotions, those all work great on three-year-olds. They also work great on the subconscious. That's great news. Bad news is, same thing, the boss is a three-year-old. So the boss throws tantrums, the boss wants immediate gratification, and the boss can be pretty loud and pretty bratty. And that's not such good news. But if you know how to teach and program the three-year-old, then you can prevent things like willpower battles, the weight loss yo-yo. Stacy, for instance, yo-yo dieted for 20 years. Her body would change, but her brain wouldn't change. And so I explained it to people like this. Here you are down here. You're not very happy. You want to make progress, but you're, this is your starting point, your baseline. So then you start working out, you start eating right, your body starts changing, but without brain training, the brain stays down here. So imagine a rubber band between the body and the brain. Nice and tight, it's gonna stay tight because they're linked together. So the body starts changing, improvement. Oh, this is great, awesome, I'm getting all this improvement. Brain stays down here. What's happening to that rubber band? Stretching out, more and more tension, cognitive dissonance, and so, Pretty soon, you're done with the diet or whatever program you were on, or you just fall off the wagon because it gets too hard as that stretches out more and more. It gets harder and harder and harder until pretty soon, the brain says, all right, come on back. The tension has been increased, and so boom, snap back. There's yo-yo diet. It's the brain's fault. But when you're changing the brain at the same time with the body, rubber band's always there. You can't get rid of it. This is what happens. Now you get to the top, 
maybe you fall off the wagon. Now look what happens. Brain says, no, we're different now. Boom, snaps you right back up. Because your cravings have changed, your habits have changed, everything's changed. So when you change both together, that becomes permanent. But it also is easier along the way. So when your body's changing and improving, so is your brain, it makes it easier. So you don't have this anymore when you're halfway. There's no tension. It's changed with it. So there's less willpower along the way, and then when you get there, it's permanent. You're thinking differently, your brain's rewired, and you stay that way. So she kept trying the same thing over and over, yo-yo up and down, nothing ever worked. And then here's her after picture. After, she learned a technique called EFT. It's a tapping technique, kind of an acupressure technique, and some other methods that she used, but EFT was her favorite. Weight loss came easily, and she kept it off with a changed body and a brain. Here's Pam, emotional eater. She always made up worst case scenario stories. Negative Nelly. No, this is gonna happen. So she was using her PFC for forethought, but there are really horrible bad stories. Expecting the worst. She always exaggerated her emotions. So it was worse than it really was. And very fear-based. So she was using her PFC for the wrong reasons, and her fear centers in her subconscious brain were lit up all the time. So those are after, because she started making up best case scenario stories. She caught herself when she would make up a worst case scenario story, stopped herself, and then say, well, if I'm gonna make up stories, I might as well make up the opposite one to the one I just thought of. It's just a story anyways, so I'll make up the best case scenario story. And at first, because of her attitude, it was hard to make up those best case scenario stories. She got better at it as she practiced because this brain training stuff is all about techniques and, and lessons that you do get better at because it's a skill that you build with practice, just like anything else. The first time you hopped on a computer, it's really confusing. The first time you got a new piece of software you knew nothing about, it's really confusing. But it's a skill. You build it, you get better at it. There's, this is no different. She relabeled her emotions, which is one of the brain training techniques. Um, and by the way, everybody that is in the seminar gets the secret link to the brain training page. So you get to log on to that, you'll see all of these techniques on there. There's about 30 of them. And a lot of them are usually a video that you can watch, seven minutes or less. And uh, it teaches you these techniques that I'm talking about. So she really able to emotions. She catch herself, that's the first step. And then she step back and she say, is this horrible, really horrible? Or is this inconvenient? She'd find another word for it. And she'd actually, yeah, it is kind of, it is convenient. And then maybe she'd try another word to try to take it even a lower level with a different word that means less, that carries less emotion with it. Because remember, the three-year-old is programmed with images, pictures, emotions, things like that. And that's how you program it the fastest. So when she's relabeling her emotions, bringing it down, she's sending different images and emotions and messages to the subconscious and programming in a different way. Stop watching the news. This, she said this was huge for her because the news is designed, you probably maybe already know this, to light up your fear centers. Because when your fear centers are lit up, you buy stuff. So it's a, it's a relationship they have with their advertisers. They want you to buy the stuff that they're advertising because then the advertisers think Advertising on their channel is awesome. And so that's why the news is mostly fear stuff, to get you all worked up. And then you're in a buying mode. So she stopped watching the news, and her fear center is calmed way down. So here's Cheryl, habit girls, very set in her ways, lots of habits that are ingrained in her subconscious brain. As you can see, she's in relatively good shape, but she wanted to step it up. She had these family patterns also with her family, especially during holidays. And she was a social leader. So not just family, but with friends. And she wanted to change those patterns and those habits. She tried and tried and tried, but she still would give in. She'd go out to happy hour and she think she was gonna do really well, but then she'd leave the restaurant and she didn't even realize that she was falling off the wagon and not doing what she thought she was gonna do. But then she's like, oh crap. And it just, it was automatic. So she atrophied those old pathways with disuse, with brain training techniques. Because when you're traveling a nerve pathway, it's gonna get stronger. When you're not traveling it, it's gonna atrophy, just like a muscle. You don't use a muscle, it gets weaker, starts to atrophy. 
use it, get stronger. She got the buy-in from her family who gave her the support she now needed. She actually wrote out a contract with them. Say, here's what I want to do. Will you support me in, in increasing my health? It wasn't about you know getting lean or ripped or six pack or anything like that. She just wanted to get healthy. Will you support me? Who's going to say no to that? And so she wrote out this contract with signature lines. She said, I want you to sign it for me. She put it up in the fridge so everybody could see it. And then when one of those people offered her a drink or a cookie or something, they weren't trying to sabotage her. They just shared patterns with her. So then she would say, oh, do you remember the contract? Are you still on board? They go, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm on board. And they even started eating better and getting healthier just because they're thinking about it more. And then it helped her with all that support. And then she learned the seven minute rule, which is on that, that page, that brain training page. And then here's Pat, belief girl. She always thought of herself as a big girl. Frequent cravings, negative thoughts, limiting beliefs to create this perpetual overweight person that she didn't want to be. She treated her thoughts only as ideas. They weren't real. So that's one of the brain training techniques is every time she thought of herself as a big girl, she goes, well, Am I stuck that way, or, is it, or do I really have a choice? Is that real? How real is that? Is that true? And then she would picture herself as smaller. Because, again, images and emotions. So if she's sending images to her subconscious that she's a big girl, and with those images comes negative emotions, she doesn't want to be, what's she just done? She's programming deeper. And now she's traveling those nerve pathways that shouldn't be traveled. They need to be atrophied. So when she questions that and says, well, can I change that? Well, how about I imagine that I'm not so big? Because it's all pictures and emotions anyways. So she might as well make up another story. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. The subconscious doesn't know if it's true or not. The images and emotions you're sending it, it doesn't even care if it's true or not. It's just about sending the images and emotions that you want to send to program it. So make stuff up. Visualization, it's huge, it's so powerful for that reason. The subconscious doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. It's the same to the subconscious. So we might as well send it what we want it to believe because pretty soon it will. And then everything's become easier and permanent. So she learned that every craving, thought, or emotion, it's just a nerve pathway. That's all it is, it's not real. And she learned that the three-year-old also doesn't understand negations. What that means is she'll say things like, I don't want to be big anymore. Subconscious doesn't hear the word don't. It hears, I want to be big. The any, not anymore, don't, all those things are negations. It doesn't hear it. It only hears images and emotions, not words. So when she says, I don't want to be big anymore, what does the subconscious get? It only gets the big girl picture and the emotion attached with it, which programs it even deeper. So saying that is a bad thing. And so understanding negations don't work and turning it around to say instead, I want to be smaller, I want to be leaner, I want to be more toned, or I'm going to be, or I am. You know, those messages with those pictures sending to the subconscious, now she's programming it that way. It doesn't even have to be true. It doesn't even have to be present. It can be a fantasy. It's, as long as it's a picture and emotion that you want, and they both accompany each other, it's just as effective as the other way. Less and less, Leslie and Lester. Pattern peeps. They were patterned. She had the same cravings, which became part of their relationship. Reinforced those cravings in each other because of those patterns and those cravings. And then there's their engagement picture after they traded their cravings for ice cream, for broccoli. So they literally, and lots of others, but that's just the best example, because they literally rewired their brain to the point where they didn't want ice cream anymore. It sounded disgusting when that's, that was their favorite thing before. And now their favorite thing is broccoli. More so than the ice cream river was. They can't wait to eat broccoli because of the brain training techniques that they were using. Anyone can learn this in just seven minutes or less. Hey, here. Today I want to talk Here's to you an example of one of those videos. Like certain foods and how to make yourself not like certain foods. We all have foods that we crave, that we're just crazy about, that we know we shouldn't be eating, 
you know, we have foods that we think we should be eating, we just don't like them. The primary language of your subconscious and your memory is pictures and images. So today I want to explain to you how you can recode your brain to prefer certain foods and shy away from other foods. First, pick a food that you don't like right now, but you know you should be eating. This might be a vegetable that you know is really good for you. This might be a certain recipe that you wish you would eat more of. It doesn't really matter what it is. Just think of it now. Pause this video if you need more time to come up with that image. Now that you have this food visualized, rate it on a scale of 1 to 10 how good this food looks to you in your mind's eye. Now picture this food in your mind's eye. It's probably dimly lit. It's probably faded colors. It's probably far away, maybe kind of down in the corner of your imagination. This is the way your brain codes things that you don't like. You've been doing this unconsciously all your life. You already know how to do it. Now you just understand it so you can do it deliberately for your advantage. So first, let's turn that around. Let me show you how to code it so your brain does like it and your preferences actually change. Now, with this food pictured in your mind's eye, bring it closer. Make the color deeper. Make the colors sharper. Increase the definition. Now make it 3D. Now bring it even closer. Increase the brilliance of the colors. Increase the lighting. Now pretend you're a famous food photographer and you adjust the plate, you adjust the food, so the ambient light coming in is just perfect. Your lights are adjusted, so the brilliance of the colors comes out, and the definition you put on your best lens to bring it out, to bring it close to the camera, to make it this the best photograph possible. Looking at that food now as a photographer, what do you appreciate about that scene? What looks great? What can you tell that the people looking at that photograph later are just going to love about that food? Bring it closer yet. Right up next to you. Colors are brilliant. 3D. High def. Everything's just popping right out at you. Now the next step is to clear your mind. Think of a blank movie screen. Now say your phone number really fast. Now, rate that food again. Picture it in your mind's eye. See if there's a change on your scale of 1 to 10 of how good that food looks to you in your imagination. Was there a change? Whether or not there was, you have recoded a part of your brain about that food. The more you do this routine, the more you recode that. Because this is how the brain codes stuff. So knowing how the brain codes stuff is going to help you literally change your preferences. Some of you may have learned in beginning psychology the concept of likability. One of the key ways to increase likability is to increase frequency of seeing someone. So that person you see very often, you tend to like them more. Same thing about food. When you don't like a food, you tend to avoid it. When you see it, you go like this and you turn away. When you do like a food, you're looking at it often and long. <clears throat> The same principle can be applied in your imagination. You don't actually have to see the real food for this to work. You can do it in your imagination because the subconscious really doesn't know the difference between reality and imagination. So when you're imagining a food, you're increasing this likability factor. And when you think of it in the ways that we've described, you're actually recoding your brain to like that food faster. Okay, now we're going to do the opposite to a food that you really like, but you'd rather not like so much. Maybe it's a junk food. Maybe it's a pasta. Maybe it's a bread. Any food you know you shouldn't be eating, you would rather just not like anymore. So now take that food, think of it in your mind's eye, and rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. How much you like that food? Also, when you picture this food, you probably picture it close up with bright colors, with high def. Again, this is how the brain codes stuff. When you know how the brain codes stuff, you can actually use it to your advantage and recode your own brain. So take that food and push it away a little bit so it's a little bit smaller and further away. Now fade the colors a little bit. If you have trouble with this, imagine putting a piece of plexiglass in between you and the food so it's harder to see the food through that plexiglass. Now make that food image a little bit blurrier. Make it like an old TV. 
now it's black and white. And now it's like an old TV that doesn't even work very well. Now move the food further away yet. Now take that food and put it down in the corner of your imagination. Now think of a blank movie screen. Now say your phone number really fast. Now, rate that food again. Make sure you're in your mind's eye. See if there's a change on your scale of one to 10 of how good that food looks to you in your imagination. And see if the preference for that food has come down at all. Whether or not it has, repeat this exercise every time you want to decrease your desire for a certain food. When you repeat the exercise for disliking a food, you may find subsequent exercises, you start with the food a little bit further away. That means it's working. Or it might be close up still, but the colors are less vivid. That means it's working too. Repeating this exercise actually changes the wiring in your brain. And it changes the pathways. It puts the myelin on the nerves, the coating like a wire on those nerves to make them more efficient and it ignores some other pathways, and the myelin on those nerves starts to get old and starts to go away. You're done. It's that easy. I know some of this stuff seems too easy to be true, but that's the beauty of it. When you know how the brain codes stuff, and you know how the myelination process works, you can literally rewire your own brain easier than you ever thought possible. So that's one example. You'll see lots more examples on the uh, page that I'm going to give you access to. But they're all great techniques. And the key is just to find ones that kind of resonate with you and just go with that. Tony, chronic stress, no willpower in the evenings like we talked about before. And work late at night, poor sleep habits, and then use meditation technique to reduce the stress. Did high intensity exercise after work, stopped working for the last 90 minutes of the day. There's a whole brain training uh, technique on the last 90 minutes and why that's so important. And then committed to an earlier bedtime. So this really is timeless wisdom. And thousands of years ago, King Solomon said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And Earl Nightingale, you probably already know, all well in that name, we become what we think about. The brain, it really is the boss. And the boss of the brain is the subconscious. So whether you like it or not, that's just the way it is. But we can use our PFC to reprogram that boss and make everything easier and change things permanently. So really it's, this, it's these steps. First, you change your thoughts, which change your habits. And then when you change your habits, you really do change your life. You might also know John Maxwell, who says you never change your life until you change something you do daily. And that's the secret, is to change the daily routine. That's why it's so important to do this brain training stuff every day. At first, you probably won't. That's OK, because you'll forget some days. And as your brain changes, it might even try to make you forget on a subconscious level. It doesn't really want to change. That's why it takes some work. But when that routine is established, as you all know, you have your routines, stuff that you never forget. You put that routine in part of your day. This is part of your day, part of your routines. Then that's when life starts to change. And then the last thing is just a reminder to really be careful what you think about and its influences on others. Because those around you can be influenced by your own training. So, the Jedi mind tricks that you're doing on yourself can have effect on other people too. Like, remember Brooke Shields married Andre Agassi? So one of the things that Brooke Shields said after they got married was that, you know, I want to change certain places in my body, and she was in great shape, right? And as you can tell, her arms were awesome, but she wasn't happy with her legs. She wanted to, to add the, the legs to the great arms. Steffi Graf was the favorite legs that she could think of, and so she kept telling Agassi, hey, Steffi Graf has the best legs in the world. I want Steffi's legs. She cut out a picture like this, she put it on her fridge. She was always talking about Steffi Graf's legs. What she didn't know is that she was programming Andre Agassi <laughs> to go marry Steffi. That's why I gave the warning in the beginning. So here's the secret brain training page access. I can email this to you too if you, if you don't have a pen to write it down. xgen.com forward slash brain dash training is the page 
And here is the high security um, <laughs> password. <laughs> Open Sesame, all one word. And find which techniques resonate with you. So just kind of play around with it and see which ones you like and stick with those at first. And then once you get really good at those, then start trying some of the other ones. As your brain rewires, it'll be easier to do this and your preferences even change. So maybe one that initially you didn't like, it's like, oh, actually I like this one now. Practice often to build the skills because this is a skill. So now I'd like to uh, take some questions. We're done, so if you need to hop back to work, great. Um, or if you want to stay and eat some fitness chocolate. And these are the ingredients in case anybody has any food allergies. And the reason it's in the cooler is because the main ingredient is coconut oil, which melts at room temperature. And then as you can see down here, you can make this yourself at home. Go to xgem.com. At the top of the page, it says the word recipes. Click on the word, and it'll take you to our recipe site where you'll find this. Links to even order stuff on Amazon. Super easy to get stuff delivered to your door from Amazon, and then it, or you use a blender, cookie sheet, and your fridge. You can make it in a whole batch in five minutes. Unbelievably easy. So what we got here, I'll just pass this whole thing around, is O means omnivore. That's the whey protein with the grass-fed whey. V means vegan. The only difference between the two is protein powder. This is vegan. This is whey. And then, if you want a little pick-me-up, mocha. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the omnivore, the way. So, pass this around. Oh, and, and also with this chocolate, it is a fat burning recipe. So, I know it sounds crazy, but the more you eat, the leaner you get. You can literally eat yourself skinnier um, with this recipe. And the reason is because of the macronutrient ratio. It's high protein, it's zero sugar, and the fat in there, coconut oil, is 70% MCTs, which is a fat burning fat. It may actually makes you burn fat off your body because you can't store MCTs, you have to burn it off. And so it stokes that furnace, and then you burn off more than you just ate. So that's what makes it a negative fat. Plus high protein helps you build lean mass, which raises your metabolism. And it's super healthy because everything in there is organic, whole food, fair trade, all that stuff. So it's the stuff your body wants to eat, even though it tastes like bad chocolate that we've been programmed to believe is bad. And most of it is bad because it's full of sugar, it's over processed, you're not getting the benefits of the cocoa bean, which is a superfood, whereas here you are because of the ingredients. And it's got fiber, all that good stuff. He store, so you store it in the fridge too? Yeah. For, and for how long can you store it? Oh like gosh, how does it stay I haven't found a limit yet. Because coconut oil is an antibiotic as well. Antibacterial, and so it won't grow stuff. You just, it doesn't go mold, it doesn't go bad. So as you're asking questions, I'm gonna have this up there just in case you have, if you wanna contact me for anything, feel free. My email is easy to remember, pj at xgym.com. Alki and Kirkland Xgyms. Uh, Alki, or the Westdale Xgyms right over on Harbor Avenue on the other side of the bridge. About eight minutes from here. And the uh, the Kirkland Xgym is at, uh, on the intersection of 405 and 520. Also about 10 minutes from here. And then uh, the book I've written, Cracking Your Calorie Code, that was back in 2008. 90% of it is still accurate. So uh, a lot of people, um, enjoy getting the brain training stuff out of that, the exercise methodology things out of that, nutrition stuff is in there too. So the book was really kind of a member manual for action members. Um, just all the information that I had kind of brain dump at the time back in 2008. And then the DVD is for members to bring with them on trips. But since they've been you know, available in public, a lot of other people have been buying it too and seem to think it's great. So um, they're good resources. Questions? Yeah. This is going to be about alcohol. So I know the right answer is none. Mm -hmm. But my husband, Gabe, does this Tim Ferriss thing. Mm -hmm. So they say two glasses of red wine mm -hmm. a day is fine. Then, you know, Steve did the 30, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, but if you're going to have a drink, have a glass of vodka. Mm -hmm. 
What's your stance on all of that? I'm not a classical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, have a, have a, shot, a shot, like, do the clear. Yeah. Not a class. I clarify. Yeah. <laughs> so it's two different, you know. Yes. And we'll talk about this even more in the nutrition seminar, but the the whole the reason for vodka is because it has less sugar than wine. Mm -hmm. And wine manufacturers aren't actually required to put how much sugar is in it on the label. So most of them pump a lot of sugar in there mm -hmm. because it tastes better. And then you want to go back and buy more of theirs. So that's the problem with wine. There is a wine that just came out that is no sugar, that uh, one to two glasses a day, no effect, even if you're doing the ketogenic diet, still fine. Mm -hmm. Pretty pretty remarkable. But for sure there's no sugar in there, um, there no, especially hidden sugars that they're trying to hide or not putting on the label. Interesting. Yeah. And so it really depends on the line. Yeah. yeah. And it's just hard to tell. I've heard of this place called Dry Farm Wine. That's it. Oh. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I liked it somehow on my Facebook page, and I don't know. Uh, I liked it, it somehow. I mean, well, it just keeps showing up. I've never had this stuff. Yeah. I, I thought it looked, so it's that same. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Super expensive. But, <laughs> you know, because of shipping and everything. But it's worth it. Hmm. If you like wine, it's actually good. And I've uh, had some good reviews from people that are connoisseurs of wine, and mm -hmm. they say it's good wine. It's just super expensive. But um, yeah, if you have to have it, that's, that would be the, the stuff to have. The other thing about alcohol is any alcohol, whether it's wine or vodka or Everclear, it doesn't matter because Everclear. There's, 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 there's a thing about alcohol that is different from the sugar problem because sugar is going to raise your blood sugar, which will raise your insulin. When your insulin is elevated, you're in a storing mode. You're going to store more fat, you're going to store more protein, all that kind of stuff. And so if fat is circulating around in your body, it's going to get put into your, in your bloodstream, it's going to get put into your cells. So the idea is to keep the insulin down, so you're out of fat storing mode and you're in fat burning mode with really low insulin all the time. So that's the insulin side of things when sugar is going through your digestive system. The other side of things is the alcohol part because alcohol will bypass your digestive system. So it's not gonna spike your sugar or your insulin. It's gonna bypass it and go straight to the liver where the liver processes it instead of your digestive system. And the liver, because it's processing it, is going to turn half of it or more straight into fat. So it's fattening both ways. The high sugar wine is fattening both ways. Whereas the vodka is only fattening because of the alcohol part. They're both fattening, just different. And the other thing is, with the liver, it's busy making half of it or more into fat. And when it's busy, it's not burning fat, and that's one of the main jobs of the liver. And when it's busy doing that, guess what it's not doing? The metabolism stuff. 